Good morning, Erlanger Baptist. It's good to see you here today. I invite you to stand as we sing Worthy of Worship. of other names up there on that screen and sing about. Hopefully you had the opportunity this morning, whether you were in a life group or you were spending some time with the Lord this morning, just reflecting on who your God is, preparing you for this morning. You had an extra hour to do that, and I know you spent that wisely. Amen, amen. Well, it is November. Uh, we are headed into a very busy time, and there are lots of things that are going on. And this morning, I just want to address some of those to kind of once again go back and kind of talk about things that we have been talking about. Um, you are listening and you are hearing that COVID is on the rise and all of that kind of stuff, and so I want to address a couple things just so that you are continued to be aware of how we are proceeding. First and foremost, um, we are continuing to operate uh, like we are. Um, we are continuing to have uh, our worship at 1030. Um, we're encouraging Mass. It is not mandatory. Uh, we are asking this area right up here, if you remember, that if you're going to sit in this area, this is for medically sensitive, that you would leave every other row open. And you'd wear your mask appropriately in that area. Um, either, if you are not able to be here, I know um, as we have some of our members, they've just expressed to me, look, there's too many people in that room. And I can't come back right now. And so we continue to provide online services and online material for them. Uh, one of the changes that we've made, and you've noticed that, is that we don't have a time of offering during service. We have the plates that are sat. Um, there are also drop boxes back in the front over there. And then for those that are online, um, or if you just want to uh, give through our online means, you can do that there. But here is something that I just want to remind you. If you are sick, just stay home. Um, we, are, we have been very blessed and very fortunate that we have not had uh, a case where we have had to alert the church that someone with COVID was present. 
Um, we've had some members that have gotten sick, um, and uh, we have a current member who is sick. Uh, but they are quarantining, and so that doesn't necessarily need to come to any type of announcement because they, they weren't here. Um, but if you do end up coming down with COVID, please let us know so we can let the church family know. But if you're feeling sick, don't come. Um, just as a way of, of care and concern, it isn't the same when you're online and you're worshiping, but at least it's there, and you can participate through that. Um, we do have a, a positive case protocol. It's on our website as to how we will let you all know and to what level we'll let you know. But we are, we're trying to balance all of this as we think about it. As, as we wrestled even with last Sunday and our fall family night, um, let me tell you, there was a lot of, you know, as cases were going up, we're like, are we going to have our fall family night? Are we going to be open to the community? Are we going to do um, this gospel presentation? And I'm very grateful that we went forward and we did it um, without incident. Uh, God was gracious, and we were able to share the gospel over and over and over and over again. And I got to watch people sharing the gospel, which is always exciting as a pastor, just getting to watch people sit there and say, hey, let me, let me talk about this circle, let me talk about this circle, let me talk about this circle in Jesus Christ. I got to watch as our student and children's ministers um, shared through a skit and people just watching as they hear about Jesus. And then I will tell you just as a pastor, I love just watching you all serve together. Because it reminds us in the midst of everything that's going on that there is something bigger that is um, for us to be doing, and that is sharing the gospel. And so it was a blessing to me. And so as we try to figure out how to continue to move forward, we're doing that with care, with caution, but we want to move forward with worship. We want to move forward with being together as a faith family. And so we need to work together to continue to balance that. In light of that, about six weeks ago, we started back with our life groups, in person, everybody, all ages. And uh, so far, that seems to have gone well. We met as a, a leadership team. We kind of looked at it changing any of the protocols, um, but we, have, we haven't changed any of them. So if you're coming for a life group, remember that uh, upon entering the building, we do ask that you are in a mask, that you, when you go in your classes, because there are smaller rooms, that you're wearing that mask for right now, that when you come into this room and once you're seated, and you're not moving around, you can take that mask off if you would like, if you're socially distanced and able to do that. Um, but during life group, that's what we're asking you to do. And then Wednesday nights, um, we have been trying to wrestle with bringing back Wednesday nights and whether we do that or not. Um, at this point, um, we have chosen not to do um, our Wednesday night time yet. Um, we are still looking at that, looking at maybe starting that in January. But kind of ramping up and bringing back each part and doing that in a way that is wise. Um, I do know that the children and youth ministries are going to be doing specific things um, and maybe utilizing some of those Wednesday nights. And so stay tuned for that. There are lots of dates coming up. Jim, do you have that slide of the save the dates? In, uh, if you grabbed a bulletin, there are many different uh, upcoming events. Um, today you'll notice if you're here today. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to receive an Operation Christmas Child um, gift box that you'll be able to fill up over the next couple weeks and bring that back in. Next week, we have a combined service, and then it kind of, well, we got a baptism, which is always fun, on November 22nd, and then it kind of gets into December. There's a lot of things going on in December, and so we want to we challenge you to put those things on your mind, on your calendar, on your family's calendar, so that you're able to participate. Several of those things happen. Uh, during just uh, the normal time together, but some of those things don't. There are different times. And so we want you to take advantage of each of those chances to be together, to continue to move forward as a faith family, um, to look at next year even as we look at the uh, last church conference of the year on December 6th. We'll kind of look at where we were, where we're headed as we continue to move forward during this time. So there's a lot of things that I know that are going on out there Right? There's a lot of things with COVID. There's a lot of things politically. There's a lot of things you fill in the blank. What I want to do right now is just say, okay, we got that. But we also have a sovereign God who's in charge of all of it. And so this is our opportunity to come into this place and for some of us to set fears down and be reminded that we have a God who reigns. And for some of us to 
to come in here and find that we have a God who offers hope because of the resurrection. For some of us to come in here to be reminded that God's a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills and he's provider of his people in the midst of uncertainty. We are in this moment right now and I want to invite you into the presence of God for worship. Worthy of worship. This is the God that we have. And this is the opportunity we have right now to meet with him, to lift our voices together and praise him. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this morning. And I thank you for the chance to do just that. To meet with you. The God of the universe. The architect of all things. The one who reigns supreme. Even over our emotions. You can quiet that storm. And so, Lord, I pray that right now we would direct our attention to you, that our eyes would be lifted heavenward as we sing together, as we open your word together, as we seek opportunity to pray and to give and to support and to be involved in ministry, all of these things, taking the focus off of ourselves and rightly placing it upon the one who guides it all. God, right now. Give us the grace to worship. May your spirit dwell in this place, inhabit our praises, and lead us in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Well, we are now at week five of our worship series of lessons. We've talked about our approach to worship, worship through singing, worship through prayer, the role of scripture in worship. Why are we doing this? Well, if you don't remember, John 4, 23 through 24 says, God is seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth, and we want to be found as those people. So today we're going to talk about something important, but it's also something that can be very difficult, and I have some things in this bag we're going to use, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. First, I want to look at the Bible. What a good place to start. I'm going to look in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. This is what it says. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Honor the Lord with your what? What did I say? Wealth. When you think of wealth, what do you usually think of? Money, yes, money. So we're supposed to honor the Lord with our money. Interesting. Then it says first fruits. Does anybody know what first fruits are? Well, maybe not. So I want to look in the Bible again at Deuteronomy chapter 26 because it says a little bit more about first fruits. So kids, listen close, see if you can figure it out. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground when you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. So, a while ago several years, hundreds of years ago, lots of people were farmers. And so they had this land, and they would have fruit and vegetables and other things growing on it. And so first fruits was the first things that you grew from your land. So what happens if um, you don't have land and you don't grow fruit and vegetables? Interesting. So what are we supposed to do? Usually... First fruits. So first fruits are the things that grow that we give to the Lord. Usually our thinking, whenever we get something first, our thinking is, I keep for myself what's first, and then whatever's left, I give to the Lord. But God wants us to think oppositely, not give what's left to him, but give him the first, and then we get what's left. That's sort of opposite, because normally when I get stuff, I think, okay, what am I going to do with it? And then whatever's left, I'll give to God. But God wants us to think oppositely. So again, what are you supposed to do if you don't grow fruits and vegetables and you can't literally give your first fruits? Well, let me think about that. How many of you have ever received money? 
Yes, happy birthday, Christmas, maybe even Halloween you get a card with money. Who knows, but sometimes you get money. Usually the ways you get money are through a gift. Someone gives you money for a special occasion or you worked hard in school or who knows. And then sometimes you get it because you work. You have chores, you work a job, who knows. Maybe you are collecting leaves or you mow yards, but you get money. So when you get money, you have a question to answer. What am I going to do with this money? That's what you have to answer when you get it. So I have it in this bag, this right here. What does this look like? An envelope. An envelope. So let's pretend it's my birthday. So I get this envelope. Woohoo, big cake on it. I open it. Oh my goodness, there's money. Happy birthday to me. So I have $20, 5, 10, $20 in my card. And so now I have to ask, what am I going to do with this money? And usually, what do we think? Yes, we think, what am I going to spend it on? Yes, I could buy that hover thing that makes me fly. Or I could get that Nintendo Switch I've always wanted. I'm sure $20 is enough to get that. Anyway, who knows? We're thinking about what we're going to spend it on. But remember, God wants us to think opposite. Instead of what can I spend it on or what can I buy, we should think what? What do I give? Yes, that's what our first thought should be. Not spend, but give. Because God doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our first fruits. So my first fruits is as soon as I open this card, first fruits, $20. What am I going to give from this $20? The Bible also teaches that when we give, we should give at least 10%. Now, I said at least 10%, so our first fruit should be at least 10 So when I say at least, can you give more than 10%? Yes. yes, but should you give less? No, that's what at least means. You're exactly right. So who knows what 10% of $20 is? 20 cents? No. Speak it out. Two dollars, yes. Well, I don't have two dollars, so that's forcing me to be more generous. So I'm going to give five instead, because I don't have a bank. So I'm going to put this in here, because I'm going to give it. So then that leaves me with how much? Fifteen. That's still a lot of money. Still more than what I gave. But at least I did what? I gave first, from the first fruits. So after we give, then we get to think of other choices of what we to do with our money, which there's the spend one we've already talked about. What's another option I can do with the money that I've received? Oh, look, I happen to have one of those. Yes, save. I could save money. Is that a good thing to do? Is that wise? Is this enough for that brand new TV for my bedroom? No, so what should I do with it if I want that brand new TV? I should save it, yes, and not do that yet. But the main thing I need to do, first fruits means what? Give it, yes, absolutely. Now, do we give an offering because we are pleased with how awesome Pastor BJ's sermon was or the music was just wonderful today? I think I'll give something. Is that why we should give? No, because then what happens if his sermon's not so good? Or the music sort of... Then we don't give. Is that how giving is supposed to work? Absolutely not, because it's the first fruits, not the fruits when we're happy. It's the first fruits you're supposed to give. Are we supposed to give so that people will see us and be so excited we're givers? Look what I'm doing. No, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to give. Why? Because God tells us to. Out of obedience, we're supposed to obey. And did you know that giving is worship? Yes, it is. When you give, you are worshiping the Lord. Now, before... COVID, we had this, plat, this plate that passed by and we put money in it and there was this big act that made it clear that worship was happening, but now we're not doing that. But do you still have the opportunity to give? Yes, yes I believe Pastor BJ just talked about it, but we, there's uh, drop boxes in the building, there's plates in, in this room, or what else could you do? Give online, yes. Yes, sometimes that's easier because maybe you get money at home and you're not at church, but you could go ahead and give online. So I hope that today that you're ready to give. But if you're not, it's not too late. You can come next week ready to give. Maybe you have some money that you haven't done anything with yet, then give the first fruits. Maybe you'll get some this week. Or maybe you could talk to your mom and dad and say, hey, I want to give online. Can you show me how to do that? And you can go ahead and give. The point is you can worship through giving now, but you can also do it anytime. God wants us 
to think of him first and give him our first fruit. So that's what I want to share with you today, and let's pray about that. God, I thank you. You have given us so much. You're so generous to us, Lord. And so I pray that our first thought would not be, what can I spend? But our first thought would be, what can I give? And that we would do that, Lord, because that's what you tell us to do, so we can obey and so we can worship. Lord, I pray we do that even today, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and welcome again to Erlanger Baptist Church. I'm going to read a bit of scripture for you this morning from John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have not told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. We have so many guarantees, so many promises that God gives us. This is one I hold on to on a regular basis for me, that I know he's coming again, and I know there will be a place in heaven for me. So please stand and join us as we sing together.
till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. good words, are they not? Amen. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. We have a God who has given his son. You may be seated. As we have talked a little bit about this world that is going on around us, and I've called you kind of to focus in, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. I want to stop, though, as the people of God, to lift up our nation. This week we do have an election. Many have maybe cast their votes. Others will be doing that this week. And one of the things that I just want to remind you of um, is what Scripture says. One of my uh, favorite verses that I always forget where it is, is that verse that talks about how the hearts of kings are like channels of water in the hands of God. He directs them where he pleases. That idea that we believe, Romans 13, that God sets all or uh, ordains all authorities that will rule. That we have a, a promise that our God is in control of all of that. Regardless of what happens behind the scenes, regardless of all that, that he works even in that. This morning we were looking at the crucifixion of Christ in our life group, and as we were talking, I asked this question, I said, why, why did they kill him? And, you know, someone said, um, you know, because he said he was the son of God, and then someone just theologically just said, because God wanted him to die? Yep. God was working that moment to bring about the death of his son. That was the preordained plan of God, that he would send Jesus Christ to be a ransom for many. Ultimately, all of these things are working in the sovereign will of God. And we as his people participate in how God brings that to bear. And even in our prayers, that he uses our prayers as a part of what he is doing. And so what I would like to do is just ask you to stop as we reflect on the fact that we live in a nation where we get to pick our leader. And where we live in a state where we get to pick our state representatives and senators. And we live in cities where we get to elect our city councils and members who will make decisions on our behalf. That we once again just come before the Lord and ask him to be gracious in the midst of all of that. We desire that we see men and women of God in those positions. Or that we at least see things that line up with principles and policies that would be biblical in their application and directives. And so however this all works out, we know that God is working in it. And I just want to take a moment as a congregation, would you just bow your head and would you just pray once again for our nation that I'll close this in this time.
Father, it is comforting to know you're the God who reigns on high. You're the one who sits upon your throne. There is nothing that surprises you, nothing that you look at and fear how you will work these things out. And yet, from my perspective, God, there are so many things that we do so poorly that I wonder why you even persist in your grace with us. God, we come to moments like this where we have great opportunity to put before our nation men and women who can serve this country faithfully, who can serve our state faithfully, who can serve our cities faithfully. And yet too often we're reduced to backbiting and slander. Being politically motivated one direction or another and seeing one another not as common Americans, but seeing one another as enemies of our agendas. And Lord, it plays out all over the place in our nation. From Walmart being fearful and pulling ammunition and guns from their shelves for fear of what might happen, for people calling on you to buy toilet paper and get ready for the next five days. God, we can live in fear. We're really good at it. And in fear, we can act in ways that in no way represent you. And so, God, I pray on behalf of just your people in this nation that we would be a people that would demonstrate that we have trust in an almighty God. Lord, that as we go to vote, that we would show up to vote. That we would be faithful in reconciling your word as best we can with the people that are put before us. That you would guide our hands God, we pray that you would be gracious to this nation. We don't deserve it. And that's why I ask for grace. We've never deserved it. It doesn't matter what our founding fathers started on. It doesn't matter any of those things. At the end of the day, the cross of Jesus Christ was necessary because we've never deserved it. And you've given so many freedoms and so many blessings by being able to be born at this time, in this place, with these freedoms. God, I pray that you would place men and women that would bring blessing to our nation and not curse. That those who are not up for re-election, those that will continue on in their positions, would turn to you. Not that we'd be a nation that is a God nation that shuns all things, but Lord, I ask just for a free place to exercise our faith, that the church would be the gospel proclaimer, not a government. But there would be ways made possible for us to continue to do that. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take this next week And Lord, we know, we know there's going to be unrest. We know there's going to be things that happen. But may they be isolated. And may they not be blown out of proportion. May they not receive the attention and therefore incite more fear. May you use your people to be people of hope. Be people who proclaim truth be people who talk about Jesus. He is the only answer. He is the only way. And he is the only one who has truth. God, may we proclaim Christ. And so we give you this broken nation that's always been broken. And we give you a, a lot of messed up people because you can do great things. 
and we ask you to move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At the count of three, when children opened the shoe boxes, they're so excited. Those faces just transformed. Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, and knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in fill shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go to the greatest journey, which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. <laughs> When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year round. God will bless and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Hi, friends. <laughs> My name is Chris Musbox, and it's so good to be here today. I hope you're listening because I'm ready to take some trips, but I can't go by myself. I need you to help. So I heard something about riding a camel and going on a ship or an airplane. All that sounds really exciting, but I can't go by myself. I need your help. So now is the time for you to come and pick up lots of my friends. There are some right up here in the front, but if you don't want to come all the way up here, there's some right in the middle aisle, or if you don't want to come to the middle, there's some in the foyer. Or if you don't want to move at all right now, then you can wait till the service ends and they'll still be here. Or at the office, there's some there. So there's lots of places where you can pick up my friends and send us on trips. Okay, you have two weeks from today is when we'll bring them back and then we'll go on a trip. So right now, if you're comfortable, you can go get a box. At the front, in the middle, at the back, take me on a trip. Fill me up and take me on a trip. You can move now. If you have your Bibles, if you'd open them up to the book of Romans chapter 3. If you have been with us over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the idea of humility. 
price of humility, and as we will discuss how we unleash God's power in our lives, when we empty ourselves of ourselves and we allow the Spirit of God to take over our lives as well. Andrew Murray says the amount of the Spirit that you have is uh, in direct opposition to how much of you you still keep in your life. The more you empty of yourself, the more he has room to fill. It's kind of like the cup. You know, you have a cup and you've got some water in it. The cup is always full. For you pessimists, it's not a question. It's just of what it's full of. It's either air or water, your options, but it's always full. And the more that you remove one, the more there is room for the other. And so this morning, as we continue this conversation about humility, I'm going to look at the idea of surrender. And what does that look like in our lives, and how maybe more practically do we see surrender take place? Because I believe that those two things go hand in hand in walking the Christian life. I proposed a definition to you, which is rather lengthy, But it says that humility from a Christian perspective is a spirit-fueled, ongoing, proper, and honest posturing of man, whereby he remains in light of God and his divine will, acutely aware of and in joyful surrender to who and what he is, both in potential and limitation, thereby experiencing and fulfilling the reason for which he's been made and ultimately remade in Christ to the glory of God. You have your place. We're going to look at a passage that Martin Luther very much wrestled with as he came to faith. And yesterday was not Halloween, it was Reformation Day. And so hopefully you celebrated correctly, as yesterday was the day that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church wall and said, Okay, let's have a conversation, which led to the Reformation. It was based on this passage in many ways. And so if you have your place, would you stand? Let's read those verses together. Starting in verse 9, I'll back up. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, hear these words, quoting from the Old Testament. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified then as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So where then is boasting? Where there is pride? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. Will you pray with me? Father, I ask that you would speak to us during this time together as we 
use this passage to help us understand. God, I thank you for the clarity of your word and the call upon our lives as a result of your word, for the conviction that it brings, and for at the same time the hope that it offers. God, I pray that you would speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. So I begin where we left off last time. The last point of the sermon last week was we will never be able to deal with pride until we have God in his rightful place as God. You see, if we are ever able to rightly surrender our pride and ourselves, we have got to put God where he is supposed to be. We're never able to deal with our pride rightly if God isn't where he is to be. This is the goal of last week's message. It was to see God as someone wholly distinct from and beyond his creation. We looked at some of his attributes, one of those those incommunicable, incommunicable attributes, even a lot of syllables to say, those that are his and his alone. We looked at the fact that God is independent, that he is without any lack, without any need. He has no dependence on anything, completely unlike us. That he is timeless, that he's outside of time, that in fact he was the creator and author of time itself. That he is unchangeable, that he is never learning, he is never short of his perfections in any attribute. He is never diminishing, never fading, never compromising in his character, his promises, or his will. And we learn that those are really good things that we have about our God, that he is all of those things because it reminds us that we can put our faith and our confidence in him alone. But at the same time, because he is preeminent in all of those things, because he created and sustains all things, then therefore, by definition, anything that is contrary to him and his goodness he would necessarily be against, right? Anything that would fall short of that, anything that would go against that, anything that would defray the relationship between us and him, between him as as creator and us as creature, we would expect then that he would ultimately set himself fully against those things. Therefore, enter God's wrath. For God to be good, he must oppose all forms of evil, from the smallest of lies to the greatest of atrocities, of spiritual rebellion, both angelic and human. We put God where he needs to be, but the moment we do that, it sheds light on who we are. And it sheds light on how God must respond to us in that. And so this morning in Life Group, you looked at the cross, and that's exactly where I'm going to continue our conversation now. Because this is what Paul does in Romans chapter 3. You see, starting in Romans chapter 1, he has developed this entire argument that everyone, by the end of chapter 3, verse 20, is all under sin, that they look at who God is, and in response to God, they've walked away from him, whether they've done that outright or whether they've done that kind of quietly on the side, judging others that do, but doing it themselves, or whether they profess to be descendants of some guy who lived a long time ago, and that should be their end, but yet in their hearts they are proud, not because of the relationship they have with him, but because of the lineage that they have from that other human. And he puts everybody in the same spot. And so for us, I would argue that surrender, for us to seek humility, and for us to find surrender, it must begin at the cross. Surrender begins at the cross. The Puritans understood their salvation to be something worthy of continued wonder. You can read it in their prayers, not only at salvation, but throughout their entire walks with Christ. The shed blood of Christ was not lost on their conscience. Or when you consider the cross, what personal prerogative can you wield? When you consider the cost that was paid to ransom your soul from hell, and the price paid to buy you back from an eternally condemned future. The hardest message 
of the gospel is the most humbling of all truths. It begins with your absolute impotence. Indeed, your calloused and darkest heart to even attempt or rightly desire reconciliation with God. If you could even possess the want to, you would be found unable to. Romans chapter 3 here says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who seeks for God. It's a very humbling statement because it means that God must act. God must pursue. We love because he first loved us. This is the reality that we see over and over again in Scripture. Salvation is impossible for man to accomplish. If it were possible, it would no longer be called salvation. Because salvation requires a Savior outside of yourself. This is the very definition. It implies a position of helplessness and of need. To add on to these verses, Galatians 2.21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Romans 5.6, for while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. The power of the cross and the blatant truth that it projects upon us is that because Christ came, this demonstrates our great need. If there were any other way, if you could in your own right accomplish these things outside of the work of Christ, then he didn't have to come. And you would be expected to achieve that relationship and restore that communion with God. And by the simple fact that God said, You can't, so I will in your place, and he will go to such extravagant means as to send his son, is the evidence that demands for us to take account of our inability. You see, we simply don't have a little sin problem. We are the problem. This is what Martin Luther finally grasped in his conversion. He understood the message of Chapter 1, 18 through 320, he understood it so well that he couldn't understand how God could even see past our sin to have relationship with us. How could God restore us was his question. He had worked so hard, but he knew that all of his attempts came up short. How could God make a way? You see, surrender starts at the cross because it's there where we see that Jesus takes upon himself the very surrender that we must Take on. We have the example set before us. Every one of us will one day surrender our lives to God, both in its longevity and in its quality, and they will be judged. It is the cross that reminds us of this first and foremost. We deserve to face God's wrath because we are sinners and we are due the consequence. Jesus surrendered and paid what we had to pay so we didn't have to. Our sinfulness is inextricably linked to Christ so that God is able to justify us having condemned his son. The son, being of infinite worth, pays the full price, experiences completely the wrath poured out, satisfies forever the debt owed, then God freely justifies sinners. It's what Luther figured out finally, and it changed everything. Salvation was Christ alone, through the cross alone, received by us through grace and faith alone. And therefore, where is boasting? It is excluded because it is to God's glory alone. Surrender starts at the cross, but I would argue this for many of you in this room who have come to faith in Christ already that too quickly we leave the cross to pursue other things. And I would challenge us, if we want to seek to continue to surrender pride over and crucify pride in the flesh, that we are called never to leave the cross. That the cross is the centerpiece. For many of us, I would say we may have come to faith in a way that's hampered our growth. Though we understood the message of the cross and we desired its effects for salvation, I think too often our conversions are momentary embraces of some divine forgiveness without a long-seated desperation or gratitude towards God. 
We've talked about the idea of cultural Christianity and convictional Christianity. It's almost as if we came to faith too cheaply so as not to value its price paid. It's like us getting up in the morning and getting in the car and turning the key without reflecting on the instantaneous response that that vehicle yields and the power generated under the hood by all we have to do is depressing a couple of pedals on the floorboard. It's like waking up in America and going out throughout your day and without realizing the centuries of fights fought, freedoms secured, innovations made. It's like flipping on a switch without marveling at the miracle to shed light. It's like going to McDonald's to er order a burger, forgetting that a cow's life was taken for that very moment for you to satisfy a momentary need. The reality is, every one of us have come to Jesus short of understanding the gravity of the cross. Every one of us didn't grasp the depths of God's love that he poured out. None of us understood the depths of the surrender offered us in Christ, who being the Son of God took on flesh and dwelt among us only then to face condemnation poured upon him that was due us by his eternal father. And so in part, our ongoing and maturing surrender and therefore humility will be based on us going deeper and deeper into the work of Christ on the cross. This is a cross-centered life's main thesis, and that is that as you walk this life All you do is go deeper and deeper into the message of understanding it. And the church is to help you. And in William Farley's book, Gospel-Powered Humility, he talks about the lukewarm affection and our appreciation for the work of God and how that also falls upon the preachers and the teachers of our generation. How a failure to consistently preach God's wrath, His judgment, and the sinfulness of sin have left us to perpetuate a pride rather than crucify it daily in reverence to God. You see, surrender is never a moment-in-time decision. It is a continual confession of the heart. Rebellion can be at any time re-attempted. You think about that. Even a people who put themselves into subjection of another people, at any time they could seek to rebel, begin a, a coup of some sort. Any rebellion, though, towards God, any refusal to obey, any disregard for his principle, that's pride surfacing again. Your pride today is a continued display of the sin that put Christ on the cross. Any lack of dependence, gratitude, and our life lived outside of the context of humility is rebellion of that greatest grace. You see, we must be warned, and we must be guarding against this mentality. We must look at our sin and seek it out everywhere. Pride is something that is so hidden from our eyes. And I know for some in this room, we speak of the Puritans, and you have a reference. Those are those spiritual guys back in the 1800s, 1700s. But I would argue sometimes we want the spirituality of the Puritans without the purity of the Puritans. We want to ground ourselves in our identity with Christ, but we forget to be eternally grateful and broken over the sin which contradicts that reception of grace. And so what I want to do is I just want to offer a couple things. In light of this passage, in light of the fact that we have this God who has given us this great cross where forgiveness is obtained. How do I actually surrender in my life? How do I do this? If it's to be in the cross and it's to not go beyond the cross, what does it look like to be a person who surrenders so that we can see humility's effect in our lives? And so I'm going to offer these up. Here we go. First one, feed on the word. I would encourage you not to just dwell on the facts of the accounts that you might know the information in the word, but instead on the truths and the worldviews that it's presented in those accounts. We will not be confronted with ourselves until there's a sharp two-edged sword. 
under the power of a divine physician able to do his work. You will not naturally gravitate towards a knowledge of God without his word speaking into your life. Feed on that. If you desire to surrender, you need someone speaking into you, outside of you, helping you to see that. Pray. This is, this is the critical process. I, I, I understand these two things are linked, right? The more that you are humbled, the more that you are going to pray. And the more that you pray, the more you are going to be humbled. And so do it. Pray. Confess sin sincerely, specifically, regularly, and repentantly. Be a person who is grieved over sin, broken by it, not in generalities, but in its specifics. Be one who does that regularly, repentantly, meaning in the moment of con confession willing to turn and to walk differently not just to say you caught me again in the cookie jar god but to put away the cookies completely we must be broken by our sin it's past what it caused christ on the cross it's present what it's doing in our relationship with the heavenly father with its future effects that which it's breaking relationships and messing up things in and around our lives and our opportunities to share the gospel Fourth is this, fight to set aside distractions. We are a distracted church. Never more, I would argue, maybe in a history are we so distracted. We have a phone that can distract us and is in fact designed and set up to do just that 24-7. We have the opportunities at our fingertips to put anything other than God and his word in front of us. We think maybe the most important thing going on right now is an election. But I would argue that there are things more important, like sharing Christ than sharing our political views. That there are reasons we are created, reasons why we exist, ultimate destinations and goals that we will experience. It's a positive way of saying, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated in heavenly places. And then I want to challenge you to do this. Practice. Just try it. You don't know how to ride a bike until you get on it and fall off of it a bunch of times. For some of us, I think we, we think, well, when I get good at it, then I'll do that. Whether it's sharing your faith or living a life fueled by the Holy Spirit. I just have to learn enough, I'll study, I'll watch YouTube videos on it, and then I'll go do it. But I don't have time to do it right now, so I won't. I would challenge you, whatever you know, put into practice now. Just start. It is not going to be all or nothing. In fact, we read about the disciples. It's messy. It's ups and downs. It looks more like this, like a roller coaster a little bit, than it does just this straight mountain or this jump and ascent. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of this, but it keeps going up. I would challenge you in this as well. Don't rely on the church to create and nurture it. I would argue that our faith is built at home first and foremost. Our faiths are to be personal, in the closet, alone with the word in your room. They are be, to be experimented on through familial interactions and relationships. They are to be forged in the crucible of marriage, refined by the fires of parent and child one to another. And then I believe they are to be brought to the church. You see, some of us come this morning with very little to show for the week's effort. We've done very little in the way of spiritual growth and maturity. We offer very little to advance the worship and praise experience of this body. Because we've set that on the shelf and just existed for the past week. So we enter in here no closer in our walk with Christ, no more dependent upon him and his life in us. Others come in pretty beat up from setbacks, from their inability to even adequately express the inability. They come reminding, being reminded afresh of who God is, who, who restores hope. He reminds us of victory, revives us with his spiritual indwelling presence, renewing us 
putting our confidence in his working in us, not upon ourselves to accomplish it. Some of us have tried to walk out there and we're getting pretty beat up. And we come into this place and we're reminded of truth. We're reminded of who God is and it's Christ in me. And we sing it. And we celebrate that. And yet others this morning come. Maybe you've seen God do victories through you. And you're ready to worship. And you're ready to carry the emotional fuel for the rest of us who need a little help. Who need to see that vibrant expression and joy in community. So that they can, like Aaron and her, lift the arms and help worship. Next thing I would say is this, share it. Not the gospel. I won't say that is not a good thing. I'll say that later. But I mean this. Share this idea of surrender with someone. To whom are you accountable? Who are you in relationship with? Last week, our pastoral staff turned in their annual reviews where they had to look back at their ministries over the past year. Teachers, you get to do PGPs, professional growth plans. Maybe some outside the teaching profession gets to do something very similar. We're all the time evaluating things, are we not? And yet, what happens when we come in here is we don't talk about it. One of, uh, I was in a previous life group, and the, the worst question that could ever be asked was, how is your abiding this week with Christ? It was perceived to be an affront, because we don't call each other to account to say, hey, what does it look like? What did God do this week in you? How did he grow in you? How did he challenge you? Where did you fail and you could have seen him work in a different way? And so I think a lot of times we're immature because we just keep everybody out here. We put on a good face for long enough to get ourselves back out of here. But we know we got to be here. we got to check the box, but we're going to get out of here as fast as we can. Last thing we want to be is real, vulnerable, transparent in our struggles. But there are things that help us when we're called to account. Three-day kitchen and bath. It better be done in three days. That's all I got to say. They set a standard. They set a bar. They set a goal. How are we doing that in our own lives? Next thing is this. Actively depend upon the Spirit. Surrender is found when the hope of an alternative is lost. Right? If we have an alternative, we won't surrender and we won't depend on the Spirit of God. If we still think we're strong enough, then we won't actually give ourselves over to Him. Surrender is found when realities are snapped back to biblical foundations. Surrender is the only accepted when the surrender over to someone else's control is recognized as a better plan than the one we got. Amen. That's the only time you ever surrender. They say, surrender or you will die. If you, if you surrender, we will let you live. I'll take surrender. We look at our options and we decide which one is best. And here is the question for us, church. Do we look at God and say, surrender to you is better than what I can do on my own? And most of the times, if we're honest, when we wake up the next day, we might verbally say it, but we pragmatically live it differently. Depending upon the Spirit, it's taking all of this and letting it just kind of work in our hearts and work in our minds. So we actually see that our end isn't sufficient. That there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. What benefit are you now deriving from the things that brought you death? None. Shall we who um, have been saved by grace, shall we continue in sin? May it never be. But this is the opportunity we have, and so we are called to depend which is an act of surrender, practicing it over and over again. But I would also say this, don't make the ideas of humility and surrender or dependence your God. Don't make the idea of humility or surrender or dependence on God the actual God that you worship. 
Instead, keep at center the God to whom you're surrendering. You see, saying the right things because you know that they're supposed to be the right things can actually lead you to being a Pharisee. The very power that you seek will evade you because you seek it for the wrong reasons when you're more bound up in the correctness of how to live the Christian life than to be fueled by the one who provides the Christian life. And so don't take those ideas and worship them. The one who seeks humility finds himself to be the one who ends up most proud. If you are not broken over your pride, I would challenge that you are not any closer to humility just because of that. Next one is this. Keep talking about the gospel. Not just to others, but yourself. That this is the idea that we are continuing in this gospel and continuing to talk about it, continuing to think on it, continuing to pray over it. Share the gospel, but share it with yourself as well. Next one, affirm any spiritual progress to be truly the work of God in your life. That's how you surrender. You look and say, something positive happened. Praise God. John 3, Jesus says, those that come to the light have their deeds be revealed as being wrought in God, born of God. As they come to the light. So therefore, what we say is there's nothing good that dwells in me that is in my flesh. And so anything that is positive, anything that looks like Jesus, anything that looks like something that is pleasing to God or satisfactory to God emanates from him through me because I got out of the way. Practice that. What does it look like to lay down at night and to think about what God has done? On the flip side of that, redirect worldly praise, achievement, accomplishments, recognitions to God who can guide you in the spiritual appraisal of those things. You see, sometimes we are so quick to receive accolades and to get little stars all over us, to feel so good about ourselves, but the question is, are they of spiritual value? The things that we hold on to that we want to feel good about Do those actually move me forward in my relationship with Christ or do they actually pose more of a hurdle? Say, okay, Lord, these are the things that I accomplished. These are the things that I got recognition for. Are those things that honor you? Are those things that I've done in light of you? Or am I holding on to those things with a very worldly perspective? Do they have eternal significance? And the last thing is this. As Nike would say, just do it. I just say, apply these things. Man, wouldn't it be great? At the end of 2021. To look a whole lot more like Jesus because we just started trying. To surrender to apply the things that we're learning, the things that we already know. What would God do at the church as we surrender more and more of ourselves over to him? That we empty out ourselves and let him fill us all the more. That we take all of the things that we're getting, all the things that we're hearing, and we put them through the guise of the cross, and we say, okay, Lord, what do you do with that? How do I live in light of that? If we're to be people who are not prideful, we must be emptied in surrender. So how are you practicing surrender? Here are some ways. And I want you to to do that. Go and say, okay, Lord, Preacher said it. Help me. Because even the act of surrender is a work of God in your life. And so seek Him to do it. Will you pray with me? Fathers, we have this moment just to stop. And we're dealing with 
this idea of humility, rightly see. God, we have lived, for some of us, 10, for some of us, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years plus. And a lot of those years, we would confess that we have been ingrained with a way of living life. And God, for many of us, we would say, yeah, those things don't line up real well when it comes to the litmus test of Scripture. God, we think of the fruit of pride versus the fruit of the Spirit. We can look at our relationships. We can look at our love for you. We can look at our time with you. We can look at our response to the world. God, help us to be people who lay everything down. God, help us just today to take a step. That we may not be proud. That it would not be about us. But it would be about you. Because you need to be seen in this world, not us. Your hope needs to be declared. And it needs to be lived out through us, experienced by us, so that others might receive it. God, give us grace. Give us your spirit. Empower us to do that which you want to do through us. May we surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.